Welcome to Tone Talk. How's everybody doing today? This is Antonio Moore coming to you from Tone Talks. I have a special guest today to bring to you, none other than the uh, great Tim Wise. We're going to have a great discussion today about a number of topics. Uh, we're going to talk about the NFL, the NCAA regarding basketball and the, and the FBI investigation. We're going to talk a little bit about Obama and Kamala. And we're going to talk about the new wealth data that's come out in the last few weeks. Um, I look forward to having a great discussion. Uh, before I introduce you, Tim, you want to say something to the audience? Oh, just thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Looking forward to the conversation. Lots of stuff to talk about, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Tim Wise is, is an ally to the whole discussion about black wealth, um, racial wealth inequality, and everything else. I think he spent his life, in a, in a way, committed to making sure that we have this discussion, that the the, the discussion is pushed forward in, in, in uncomfortable situations. Um, as I understand it, he went to Tulane University. He's trained everyone from teachers to police officers in dealing with and dismantling the whole idea of, of racism. Anything you want to say to the audience before we start? You know, not, not really, although I, you know, I joked at the event we were both at that I probably need to stop talking about all the police officers I trained because they clearly hadn't learned whatever lesson I was trying to teach them. So I think I need to either stop doing that work because it's not working or stop talking about it because it's not working because clearly we got a lot of problems that no training mine or anyone else uh, is taken care of that's for sure yeah it's going to be a consistent push uh, just to give a shout out to the angela project and dr kevin cosby yeah. and everything they're doing down there i look forward to working with them going forward you know me and tim wise met at the angela project when we both spoke there it was a powerful chance to deal with the need to discuss reparations the need to discuss the racial wealth gap and the need to get in front of of different kinds of groups in this case it was a a set of, of people that represented six million Baptists, and I, I think that these are the kind of environments. And it was it was forty uh, percent white, actually, ironically. Yeah. And, and these are kind of discussions that will allow us to move forward to really deal with dismantling racism and dealing with how do we begin the dialogue around reparations. So, starting Tim Wise, I, I recently had a chance to uh, look over your 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 discussion. It was titled "Race, Whiteness in the Era of Trumpism." And what I what I noticed, like that jumped off the gate for me, th this falls into context with the uh, uh, first white president piece that Tana Hazi Coates did, which I responded to. And I've shared my response with you on Huffington Post. Uh, Trump isn't the first white president and he won't be the last. Um, and I wanted to know, you said Trump is not something new. Right. And then you said he's not he's un uniquely dangerous, but not new. And I wanted you to explain that and explain. And, and give us some of your thoughts on Colt's piece. Right. Well, when I said he wasn't new, the, po the point that I made with that argument is that, you know, all of the arguments that I'm hearing about how new he is or how unprecedented Trumpism is or how it's uh, not normal, I think is the phrase you hear a lot of people using, when in fact Donald Trump and Trumpism is really rooted in the oldest playbook in American politics going back to the colonial period, which is rich white man telling not rich white folks that their enemies are black and brown people. That's not new. It's not something Donald Trump thought up. Um, it's been around literally for 400 plus years going back to the colony. So the point I was trying to make there was that, that in a sense, this is the same monster that has always been under the bed in this country and on this land. And, and I think it's important to know that because I think it's important to realize that when you're fighting the monster, if you think it's a new monster, it's scarier, right? You, you don't think that you can use certain strategies or learn lessons from the past when in fact you can and you can take strength from that. Uh, when I talk about the unique danger, now this is where it gets a little dicey. I don't actually think that he's per se more dangerous, but I think there's a uniqueness to the danger of the moment, not because of him, because like I said, he's not doing anything different. What makes the moment uniquely dangerous, I think, is that in all of these past eras when white folks like Trump played upon white racial fears or, or, or a sense of grievance in order to backlash against gains by black and brown folks, white rage, as Carol Anderson calls it at Emory University in her latest book, um, there was always a certain degree to which it worked, obviously. White rage was very effective, and, and, it, and it rolled back a lot of gains for black and brown folk. But in those eras, white folks were still such a commanding majority of the population, 80%, 85%, 78%, that the sense of grievance didn't always translate into full-scale backlash because there was still that sense, I think, in a lot of white folks' mind, 
like we were still running stuff. You know, when you had 80%, you could say you were the victim of reverse discrimination, but honestly, at some point, you had to sit back and be like, mm, that doesn't really make sense. The problem is right now, we're at a unique moment in American history where you got a few things that have happened all at once that make Trumpism uniquely dangerous because of the context, the background noise. So the four things that I talked about in my book, Dear White America, were the election of a black president, albeit not one that empowered or really change the racial dynamic, but symbolically challenge white America's sense of who leaders ought to be. Secondly, the economic meltdown that confronted white people with the kind of insecurity that we were not used to since the Great Depression. Uh, 85 years had gone by since white communities saw anything like what happened during the recession, so you had that happening at the same time. Then you have popular culture, which is thoroughly shifted. Uh, everything from music to fashion to food, all of pop culture icons, increasingly multicultural, which again, you and I both know, doesn't mean the actual power dynamics have changed, but symbolically, when culture begins to shift, the dominant group can feel threatened. And then fourth, biggest thing, demographic shift. So in the next 30 years, if it is true, and it is apparently, that white folks will be maybe about 55, maybe 50% of the population, folks of color will be another 50%, all of those things happening at once confront white folks with a level of insecurity, I don't think a justifiable insecurity, but a predictable one that makes Trumpism more dangerous because he can capitalize on all of those things in a way that passes. Um, the interesting thing that I see as well is, and I pointed this out in my piece, um, is you had Washington who owned 317 slaves, chased one to the end of her life. You had Andrew Johnson who basically, you know, we, what would black America have looked like had it got civil rights in 1866 versus 1966 and been able to take partake in the true American rise, you know, right. um, so basically you have Andrew Johnson changing the entire tra So you have George Washington who, what would it have looked like if George Washington had said, I'm, I, 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 I renounce slavery. I'm going to give away all my slaves. Slavery should not be in America. What would it have looked like if Andrew Johnson had said in 1866, I, I agree. There should be civil rights for these blacks. And a hundred years earlier than it happened, we had civil rights during the industrial revolution and everything else. And so what I come to is this, is this, is this issue where Trump has become a place for white people to hide. And I, I guess the reason why I say that is while the demographics are changing, the wealth isn't white America now still controls 90% of the wealth. If you look at land, white America controls 97% of the rural land six white families own more rural land than all of black America combined. So does it matter if after citizens United, you vote with dollars, if the demographics change? And I, I guess I put that to you. It matters substantively. So for instance, that white anxiety that Trump is playing on isn't rooted in an honest assessment of where things stand. So you're absolutely right about that. But the, the thing about white anxiety it wasn't rooted in reality when Andrew Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Act of 1866 either, saying what he said, if you recall, one of the things he said when he vetoed it was that it was essentially, he didn't use the term reverse discrimination, but he, he implied it. He said that there were things in that act that gave opportunities to blacks that had never been given to whites, which is, of course, absurd. I mean, obviously, the Naturalization Act of 1790 made whites the only citizens of the country up until that point. But whiteness had never been named, and so therefore white folks, including Johnson, could assume that there was no racialized benefit to being white because it had never been named as a benefit, at least not in his head, because it was normal for him. So you're absolutely right. Things aren't necessarily really changing in that sense, and particularly with regard to wealth. That, that's one of the areas where the changes have been least impressive and, in fact, in some ways have gotten worse. And but one of the most important areas as well. They are, if they not are. the most important area. Yeah, I mean, ultimately it is, right? So you can have the income gap shrink a little, but if the wealth gap expands, the income gap means very little, if anything. So you're absolutely right. The problem is, when white fo if white folks are starting from an assumption, and I think we are, generally, that we, we deserve, we are entitled to, because the system has told us this all of our lives, that we're entitled to 80%, 85%, 90% of the good stuff, whatever that is. If all of a sudden... We find ourselves just demographically going to be only half or 55 percent um, in terms of, you know, uh, 
uh, globalization of the economy, finding ourselves out of work or insecure about work. Now, nowhere near what black and brown folks are, but again, we weren't used to it. If all of a sudden we find a lot of our wealth being wiped out by the recession, again, not as much as black and brown wealth was, but more than what we expected, then it's all relative. In other words, the insecurity is not about are we really losing the game? We're not losing the game. We're still winning the game. But if you've been winning by four touchdowns and next time you only win by a field goal, you still won. Or if you only win by two touchdowns, because it's more than a field goal, let's be honest. Um, But if you only won by a little bit, you feel like the game is getting tighter. And now you start to worry because it's all relative to what you expected it to be, not necessarily relative to the reality of where you are vis-a-vis somebody else, I think. No, I um, it's interesting that the the way the way you uh you you pose that because I've had two or three very interesting interviews. One of them was Shapiro, um, Black Wealth, White Wealth, and he talked about how much of the reason that we have such a bad dialogue on race is for a long time we looked at only we only looked at income. You know, we didn't really look at wealth until the '90s, and I think. What 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 I, I come to you as 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 a, a kind of interesting like twist on that analogy is I think what starts to happen is we we reframed race as the Hatfields and the McCoys, yeah. and in that context I mean black people weren't in the race they were the shoes they right. were a piece of an equipment and right. now the shoes have a hole in it and you wanted to race a race against white folk right. and I think for a lot of white folk so many different pushes have made them not understand black people. I, I, you know, I call it the decadent veil as far as black celebrity, 300 black, black basketball players somehow are multiplied to be millions of people. By the way, media shows them over and over again, doing stuff that I deem irrelevant, their, their marriages, their home sales, things that white people are doing all day, every day. And I think for, for, for me, what I come back to is, this larger question of what is the value of whiteness for the lower class? Cause I look at a show like breaking bad, right? Bacon. I look at a show like breaking bad. And for me, I contrast that, I, you know, I was nominated for an Emmy for a documentary I did with on, on the Iran Contra freeway, Rick Ross, the Rick Ross lawsuit and the imagery of the dope dealer, which I understand. And I, I, I partially agree with about, you know, the, the insidious reality of selling crack cocaine. But we flip over to Breaking Bad, and just as much as it was a show to me about meth, it was a show about whiteness, and the power of, 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 of the main character to be able to use his look to yeah. traffic between being a teacher and a meth salesman, to the point where we actually saw meth. I saw an infant, <laughs> this is gonna trip you up. I might even pull it up so everybody can see it. They had a costume for an infant to look like a person that makes meth in the, um, in the trailer and, and 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 you saw this commercialization of basically white privilege in that sense and i i, I yeah. let me ask you it in a question to kind of what is this value of whiteness for the lower class to be able to look anonymous not anonymously like like wealth the the primary value of of whiteness to the working class is psychological it's what du bois called the psychological wage um this idea that I don't have much. I might not have anything, really, economically, but at least I'm not. And then you fill in the blank, black, you know, Latinx, indigenous, whatever it is. And and I think for 400 years, or at least 300 and some, that psychological wage has worked amazingly well at convincing working class white folks that they have more in common with the rich than they do with black and brown folk. Now, it's not objectively true, but... Um, but, you know, this is why it's psychological wage and not the kind that actually pay your bills, pay your health care, you know, send your kid to college or whatnot. Um, I think the other potential benefit, and I don't want to overplay this, but I also don't want to underplay it, is that whiteness still has historically held out, if not the promise, the and if not the guarantee, well, if not the guarantee, at least the promise of mobility, right? In other words, to be white meant, even for working class people, that... I was going to have, excuse me, at the very least, what we could call horizontal mobility, i.e., my daddy worked in the coal mine, I work in the coal mine, my son's going to work in the coal mine. Now, we know you probably still want to die by the time you're 58 if you work in the coal mine because you're going to get black lung or whatever. Um, you're, you're, you're not going to, you might get disability even before that because of an injury. It's not going to be an easy life. You're not going to get rich. 
but there was a sense of a, of a promise of some level of stability and predictability that people of color never took for granted, including, I should point out, black coal miners, right? I mean, even those who worked in the mines who were black didn't take for granted that they would always have work, but I think white folks did. Other white folks, maybe not coal miners, maybe not in real poor rural areas, but other white folks, maybe farm families and others, um, could always assume a certain, uh, uh, not even just horizontal, but vertical mobility, a sense that if they worked hard, that their kids really would be better off than they were. So their working class status was, as the old saying goes, we're all just temporarily embarrassed millionaires, right? In other words, we're just, we're just temporarily struggling, but one of these days, dot, dot, dot. And I don't think people of color ever could take that for granted in this country, but I think a lot of white folks could, including those at the bottom. And they did, even though the data has said for most of our history, that for the vast majority that wasn't real, that, that, that upward mobility really wasn't real for people who started at the bottom except for a very small percentage. So even a very small percentage of white folks who start at the bottom actually make it to the top. Now it's a bigger percentage than the number of black folks who start at the bottom who make it to the top. But even for most white folks it isn't true, yet there are just enough examples that they can point to statistically or even anecdotally to convince them that it's actually going to happen and that one of these days they're going to be as rich as Bill Gates. They're going to be as rich as the Walton family, as opposed to being a greeter in one of the Walton family stores, you know? And I, I, I guess, you know, Matt Brunick did a, did a great chart and I've used it in my animated video, which I'll include at the end of this to explain like wealth. One of the things that I find interesting about whiteness is not just like the psychological impact in that sense, but more so the ability to hide in anonymity, meaning a store clerk sees you, she doesn't know if you have a million dollars or $2 million or $12 million. So she has to treat you with a certain decency because you might. And, and I think for the other thing that I see as well is white America has a natural class arc. So if you were to see, and I'm pulling up a chart now, um, essentially it shows that the blue line is white America and it shows that white America, you know, top 30% worth three, three, uh, 30% of families worth 350 or more top 20% worth five median family worth $500,000 or more, uh, top 10%, 8 million homes worth, worth a uh, million four or more. Now what's interesting, not just is the amount, the, the pure raw amount of, cause understand 8 million families, there's only 14 million families, black families all combined. So yeah. it's not just the raw amount. It's the fact that also the families that are in the 8 million that have 1.4 or more might have three family members in that group, a la Trump. Yeah. So you don't have family in the bottom 10th percentile, bottom 10 percentile, bottom 20 percentile begging you, holding you down. You have family as Trump had where, when he failed to prop you up. And it creates a sense of sanity for white America, whereby the people around you are like you as you as you move up or you stay, stay, stay the same. So I don't even know if white America, you know, I don't know if that white person in Ohio wants to be Bill Gates. I mean, you look at Buffett, Buffett don't want to be Buffett, that little house that he lives in. <laughs> and so on the, on, the, on the other side with black America, top 5% of black homes worth 350 or more, probably all boomers, 700,000 homes out of 14 million. The, you know, by my data, what I showed is that the bottom half is actually negative, negative, right. I think around 200 billion using, using a combination of data from, uh, from Brunig and others. Long story short, what I'm saying, but the, what, but what you see is that the upper 65% of, of black America aspires to dreams that mimic maybe the top 20, 15% of white America that are millionaires. And what is created is is this interesting dynamic where while we talk about white privilege, what is black cost? And and so like there's this there's this other side to white privilege whereby not only are you privileged to be white, but you're privileged to be normal and have a, a stability to your quality of life. Whereas on the black side, due to a combination of crack, rap rap and the rise of the Jay-Z and Puffy imagery, uh football and basketball, which we'll get to in a second. And then this unnatural arc in terms of wealth, the black existence is kind of a place where, as I, as I talked with Shapiro, because while I was talking to Shapiro, um, Charlemagne's book, Black Privilege, came out. And he, he, as I, doesn't understand what Charlemagne was talking about. 
Yeah. There's this there's this interesting like cost that nobody talks about from being black, not genetically, but socially right. kind of baked in. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there there is a, you know, a hidden cost. And it's, it's one of the things that Shapiro's co-author on Black Wealth, White Wealth, Melvin Oliver yeah. wrote about in his follow up book, um, which is uh, I think it was I think it was Oliver's. Maybe it was yeah. Tom's. I, I think it was Oliver's um, about the hidden cost of being African-American and, and specifically looking at blackness as particularly with regard to finances as as having a tax that you pay in effect uh and whiteness as a subsidy so in thinking of it in those terms it is literally in many ways and has been historically a a reverse robin hood taking from those who don't have and providing to those who do both through fiscal policy monetary policy labor policy land policy and, and distribution of land so there's the psychological, there's the material, and I think you, you, you point out a really important thing about the normalization of whiteness, because what that means is that if, let's say I am white, well I am, that's what I have to say it, uh, as a white person, if I don't aspire to Bill Gates, if I don't aspire to being rich, if I don't aspire, or if I don't aspire to having a big house, or you know any kind of outward trappings of success, so if I want to be Warren Buffett, you know, and live pretty modestly, and sort of eschew all the trappings, not all the trappings of both, but a lot of the outward ones. Um, I'm not going to get judged for that. I can sort of be this sort of, you know, casual, you know, I'll give you an example, but, you know, for, for, for white folks who come from small town America, rural America, um, they, yeah, they don't really aspire to what we would consider sort of an urbane, metropolitan, um, sort of... Uh, Super capitalist. Yeah, yeah, super the capitalist. Provincialism, the provincialism of small town life is fine for them. They don't care if they don't have a passport. They don't care about any of that stuff. They're very content with it. But the reason they can be, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but the reason they can have nothing wrong with it is because they will not be judged if they decide to live in that way. If nobody's going to, like, you know, you think about coal miners right now who are saying things like, bring the jobs back to us or or in the rust belt right bring the jobs back and that's what they think trump is apparently going to do for them now here's the thing if black folks were to say bring the jobs back to the cities that have been vanishing for 45 years because you know manufacturing decline and, and capital flight began in, in earnest around 73 so you have black folks hit first cities hit first if they had said bring the jobs which they tried to say bring the jobs back bring, you know we want to work like we were working in these in, in manufacturing people would say, well, why don't you move? What's wrong? You need to move where the jobs are. But white folks can live in that sort of stasis, that kind of, where I don't want to move, I don't want to change anything about my life, and people sort of go, well, that's right, you shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to. You ought to be able to live just like your great-granddaddy did. And, and people of color are expected to aspire to more. The problem, therefore, becomes, though, in a capitalist society where the aspirations are defined really not by the the, the, the the marginalized, right, but by the dominant group, those aspirations sometimes take on the trappings of the dominant cultures. They become getting commodities. They become about getting stuff, right, because that's what's being sold from from the top down. And if you're if you're a member of the top, if you're a member of the privileged group, you have the luxury of sort of ignoring all that if you want. I think most still don't ignore it, but you have the luxury of ignoring it. You have the luxury of being immune to it. You have the luxury of tuning it out because no one's going to judge you when you tune it out. If you're on the bottom and you don't aspire to that stuff. Um, then you're looked at as not having ambition. So it's a real double-edged sword because if you do aspire to it, you get caught in that commodity trap, you get caught in that consumption trap, which is actually part of you know market capitalism. But if you don't aspire to it, you get judges being trifling and, 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 and not about moving up. So it's, it's, it's really sort of a catch-22 either way, but only for black and brown folk, not for white folks, even if they're working class. You know, they, they can be proud of being working class. They can be proud of doing the same job their great, great, great grandma and, and and what you point out, you know, I I, I I love to give people's uh like words context in a different kind of way. I'm gonna bring up the racial dot map right now to kind of show America. Each dot represents a person. Um, the blue dots are, are white America. The green dots are Black America. The red and yellow dots are Asian and, and Latinos. What you'll see is that there's large swaths of America where there aren't any body but white folks. And I think that we don't really understand that because we live line of sight. And, you know, black people are largely throughout the South with dots on the, on the coastlines, uh, Latinos and Asians. Uh, some are in the uh, 
west south, south southwest and they're they're on the coastlines and I, and in the heart of america america largely is all blue and i i think as I, as i come back to like my point what we see is that black america has been running since slavery from you know my, my own story is my, my great aunt moved to california from brooksville for opportunity ended up moving back to atlanta uh, to retire um my grandmother she moved to new york for opportunity ended up moving back to brooksville to retire and i think what we're seeing is there's nowhere to run for black america and in context of what what, what you're saying what we're finding is capital has become vicious in a, in a new kind of way and is is, is all taking and I kind of want to use that to start looking at this this NFL issue that we saw over the last week and then transition into the FBI investigation of the NCAA. Um, I did a piece, you know, on Kaepernick, I, I thought way back in March or April, he'll never play football again. You know, I, I thought that very similar to the Gladiator times, you know, when you can't give aqueducts and bread, you give them games. And I think that that's largely, in my view, the role in part of the NFL. So many people misunderstand First Amendment. These people are at work. You don't have a First Amendment right at work. I'm not saying that you don't have a right to, to protest at any given time that you want, but this isn't necessarily a First Amendment issue. What we more so see is, I don't know how many, including Kaepernick, understood the decadent veil of black celebrity, let alone the reality of, of everything going on around them. By that, I mean line of sight again. If you're an NFL player, for how long have you, how long have you been around black, young males worth a million dollars? For years. You, you, I mean, even though you might have cousins and family member outside of that, you know, in a large sense, your world is contained in a bubble. And so now Black Lives Matter, Eric Garner, Philando Castile, bring that bubble crashing down. And I think that in some ways, what you're seeing is an inability for those two worlds to coexist in a real way. I guess I want to get your opinion and give a Well, if you think about it, um, the black athlete historically has played, and you've talked about this in previous videos, has played this function, whether it was intentional or not, really doesn't matter. They've played the function of soothing white conscience over both personal racism because oh i like that basketball player or i like that football player or you could even say the same thing about entertainers and musicians and whatever else going back to to jazz right um and it also not only soothes the personal conscience but the collective conscience about systemic injustice because if white folks can point to and they did they did this with jackie robinson they did this with bill russell think about how much bill russell said boston was like the most racist place it ever been and and and, and, and yet he served a function as this example of early on during the early days of the movement as this successful black athlete. They did the same thing with Sidney Poitier as an actor, same thing with black athletes after uh, 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 Will Chamberlain and, and Kareem and all those folks, even though they all had their issues, white folks had their issues with them, uh, particularly folks like Ali and Jim Brown at the time and, 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 and anybody that Harry Edwards even knew right as a college athlete that he was encouraging to take a stand on issues of the day but there was always that sense oj was a great example of somebody who soothed white america's conscience because as long as you were willing to wear the uniform the, the jersey of a a black athlete or put that poster up on the wall in your room you could you could use that as a shield against anyone criticizing either you or the nation as being racist and so i think you know you can think about jackie robinson jackie robinson knew full well what the institutional injustices were in the country, but he was chosen very specifically by O'Malley in, in 47 to be the first uh, in the modern era black player, because there had been black players run out of the game in the late 1800s, which most folks don't realize he wasn't the first, but um, he was someone who, who it was believed would be able to take it, right? And so there's always been that desire for black athletes to keep their mouth shut, keep their head down, do their job, which is to entertain a mostly white fan base. And that is not meant as a disrespect to any of the, of the skills or determination of those athletes or to say that they're, you know, I'm not, it's not to say that they shuck and jive for white people as, as, as some intentional thing. But, but the way that sports are set up has always been dominated by the white dollar, dominated by the white consumer, dominated by white taste. And so if you're a black athlete who takes a stance like Muhammad Ali did, 
you will be shut down. Now we talk about Ali as a secular saint, and everybody looks at him fondly, but they only started liking him when he couldn't talk anymore. Right? Post, as as you, after, you know, after Reagan, yeah, after right. Reagan, after Ali kind of was put into a different light to create that brand, yeah, you right. started to, but if you, if you go back, like, America, you know, it's, it's this interesting, like, great, like, segment where Ali talks about, you know, being the first black president. Have you, have you ever seen it? What he says, you know, and, and what he says is that he's on a show, and this is in, has to be late sixties, and they ask him, "Would you want to be the first black president?" And then everyone laughs, you know, everyone laughs. And he says, he says, "Imagine a ship, and you're on that ship, and you're in the galley, you're cleaning up in the galley. There's a party going on upstairs. They're nice and dressed and everything else. Then all of a sudden, the captain runs down and says, the ship's the." Uh, he says, you want to drive? He says, first question I'm going to ask is, is this sinking? <laughs> so, uh, you know, makes me think of Obama and the bailouts. But, like, nonetheless, what, what, I, what I bring up is one of the things that's interesting about Ali is that was a time when athletes, first of all, Ali wasn't part of a league. Second of all, Ali was Muslim. And third of all, most importantly, this is a time when you can't opt out of blackness by money. You know, I have an argument. I've had a chance to, in my in my life, really sit down and do and do dinner, break bread with everybody from Byron Allen to Dr. Dre. And one of the things that I believe happens is what wealth allows you to do in a niche kind of way is transcend racism on a on a on a one to one level. Not so much in dealing with the owner of an NFL team or the owner of a channel, but in terms of of, of being in Los Angeles at a restaurant, they don't see you as a black man anonymously that might not have money they saw you on tv they know you have money so you get to transition out of that now my point is in at least time you couldn't do that i don't care who you are you're sitting in the back and so it forced you know black entertainers to recognize their blackness in a way that's different now and somebody might say well don't serena and the fringe things that we see on television you know you look at oprah as an example and we hardly ever see hear anything about race from Oprah. But when the, the movie Selma's coming out, we hear about the bag and the bag and everything. But then when Selma's over, we don't have about race no more. <laughs> and so what these black athletes in the late 60s, race was in, intertwined into consistent messages that came out of their experiences in America. And so I guess for me, one of the things that I thought Kaepernick did is without any provocation, like in far as like, of course he had, you had all of the instances of Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, but on a personal level, it wasn't like an owner said something to him. And now I understand racism. It was a general awareness that something is amidst here. And I'm going to make a message so that America hears me either now or what happened a year from now. And, and it resonates. And it's interesting because it resonated so much that you, I believe you have a million dollar NFL PR campaign going on to shift the needle from black oppression to equality to where Jerry Jones is on his, is kneeling <laughs> before. Go even further. I mean, I would say, I think the attempt is to shift the conversation to the idea of unity, right? The yeah. idea of, can't we get along? I mean, with sort of the Rodney Kingification no disrespect to Rodney King because he did the best in that moment that he could do. I didn't, I don't expect more of him in that moment than what he gave us in 92. Yeah. But, but it's the, it's that, you know, when Jerry Jones takes the knee or when other non-black owners and, and, and other celebrities sort of make that, that statement, the question is, are they really clear on what that statement is? Are they thinking about Philando Castile? Are they thinking about Tamir Rice? Are they thinking about, Eric Garner. Odds are very slim. And I would say even some of the black athletes who followed Kaepernick are, are also thinking, I mean, Ray Lewis said what? That he like went down on two knees because he wanted he, to thank he, God he, or something. I mean, some like, always, like, you know, yeah. what was that? I mean, so so it's clear we got a lot of folks who whose understanding of the, of the intentionality of the original protest has been terribly muddled. Now, I would say the media has played a huge role in that. The president, of course, has misdirected very much on purpose, trying to make it about the flag. So now you got the right wing thinking it's about the flag and the anthem, which it's not. You got you got the sort of mainstream center thinking that it's about unity and all the owners thinking it's about unity and we're going to stand together. And that's not what it's about. 
Uh, it's about injustice in the justice system and particularly with regard to policing. And I, and I don't know how we get that narrative back when you've got everybody from the president to every one of the networks, most of the talking heads, having a conversation about the national anthem and the flag as opposed to the issue that Kaepernick was, was raising. And I think you make a good point that the fact that he was not responding from personal experience, in other words, he was not the one targeted. It's not like he had just experienced an act of racial profile. I mean, I'm sure he's been profiled before, but that wasn't what touched this off. Uh, he, he, had, he was not the one who, who experienced brutality. So the fact that he took a vicarious stance, right, made it even more threatening. Because if it had been a personal experience, you know, like when James Blake, the tennis player, got got tackled by that cop or whatever it was in New York City, if he speaks out against that, for you to go in on him, you look like a real jerk because he just got mistreated. And you can actually see it on video, and he's a star, so that sets him apart in a lot of people's minds, right? So that, if, if Kaepernick had been personally abused by an officer... Mm -hmm. um, on video, let's say, it would have been different than when Tamir Rice is shot on video by an officer, right? Or when John Crawford was shot in, in, in the Walmart in Ohio by an officer also on camera because because uh, those two guys, uh, Tamir Rice and, and – yeah, so, so when you talk about average everyday folk that are being shot by law enforcement, uh, whether it's John Crawford, whether it's Tamir Rice, or whether it's someone like Eric Garner getting choked out on the street, you can have that on video and the response will be one way. If that were to happen to Kaepernick, um, if that had happened to another major celebrity, I have no doubt that when they responded, the public response would have been quite different. But when a black athlete stands up and takes a stand on behalf of a larger issue that 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 the public assumes that they can buy their way out of, why well, you don't have to do that. You've got an eleven million dollar contract in Kaepernick's case at the time or whatever. You don't have to take that stance. So why are you doing it? That scares people more because that makes them actually think that it's not, you know, if, you, if you're speaking from personal experience, people will sometimes cut you slack because they feel like, well, at least you have a reason to be upset. They won't always do it, but if you're a celebrity, they will. Um, if, if, on the other hand, you're just taking a stance for the larger purpose, you know, Oprah Winfrey is a good example. Back, back when Crash came out in 06 or whatever it was, when the film Crash came out, she did an episode. Like you said, she doesn't talk about race much, and that goes back to her early days when she tried to show about race in the very first year, went to Forsyth County, Georgia, and had a bunch of white folks go off on her, call her racial slurs, and she said after that she didn't want to ever talk about race again because she was trying to, you know, avoid that kind of conflict and get a lot of white fans, frankly, and, and be more successful, you know. So in 06, when, she, when Crash comes out, she did an episode where she talked about um, her own Crash moment, and it was when she was over in Paris, and she was shopping for Tina Turner for Tina Turner's birthday. Now, right there, that's a high-class problem. Like, I don't know Tina Turner enough to buy her a gift, but he, she went to the Hermes store, got profiled, she said, right? And, of course, she went public with that. Now, a lot of folks backlash on Oprah because they said, well, you've got enough money, you know, why are you even complaining? Which is another aspect of it. Sometimes rich, successful black folks, even though they can definitely, on a normal day-to-day -day basis, buy their way out of the worst forms of mistreatment, God forbid they actually do get mistreated because some will be more receptive to them, but there will be that other group that says, like, Yeah, we saw we saw the same thing from Dre the other, you remember, maybe six months ago, the white guy comes, parks in his driveway, and then right. he comes out, and they basically don't blame, like, like Dre, just any old white guy. You have Dr. Dre, guy that sold... A, a, a company to Apple for a, over a billion dollars. You have any old white guy in, in in his driveway, in Dr. Dre's driveway, all right, blocking it, and we're gonna we're gonna take his side, the, any old white guy side, and then figure it out later. And, and and it's 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 a trip because what what I what I thought about when you brought up Tamir Rice was nothing other than LeBron James. Um, I did a video recently where I was critical of LeBron James when Tamir Rice was shot down. LeBron's response was tepid at best. Um, Tamir's mom was very much saddened by the, the fact that LeBron James said nothing. He sat out no games. But when uh, Stephen Curry is not uninvited or not invited to the White House, we get this harsh statement about Donald Trump. Now, I don't know if we really understand. For me, you know, I, I, I don't I, I don't like to play be an elitist, but many of these people are not college educated. And many of these people are very good at what they do, which is play basketball, rap, whatever it is. But I think we're asking them to lead in a way that we hadn't asked Muhammad Ali because Muhammad Ali had an engine around him to kind of like 
teach him about certain things. And also he didn't have an engine around him like Nike to keep him from learning certain things in some ways, you know? And I guess my, my other example of this is we look over at Jay Z and I don't know if you heard his comments about this, but I just want to share it. I'll pull it up for everybody. This is Jay Z speaking on, on, on the whole, on the whole Trump and protests. I can't even say with all due respect, with all disrespect, I just think that, you know, he's not a very sophisticated man, especially when it comes to the idea of until everyone is free, no one is free, period. That's the that's just a fact. We are all linked some kind of way. So if you oppress a certain people, everyone is in danger. That's just karmic, karm, karmically and in real life. If I'm being oppressed and you have this big, nice mansion with all this, I'm coming inside there. So this is the problem, though. This country has over 600,000 African-American males incarcerated. Contextualizing that, I've looked at nine countries, including India, with a billion people, and those nine countries together have only 600, 700,000 incarcerated. That's today. How are you, as a man, able to say about say this about oppressing a certain people and we're all linked in some kind of way in a nation that not only came out of slavery, but today has linked slavery through peonage into a into an insidious system of, of mass incarceration of a very specific group, which is young black males. And you look like a young black male and you sell your product to a young black male. And for, I guess I guess I connected to the to the earlier statement you were making, which is they're muddling the message and they really should be stepping back because they might not understand. Well, you know, it, yeah, it's a mixed bag. I mean, I, I'm willing to cut Jay and, and a lot of other folks a little bit of slack only in, in so far as, you know, they, their background is not critical race theory. So I don't expect them to speak like a critical race theorist. I don't expect them to speak like somebody that has spent their life studying like the memetics of anti-racism or like what's the best thing to say in that moment. I mean, it, it, it can be problematic and I agree with you. If that's not your background, maybe sometimes it's better not to speak. But the problem is these are icon figures. Now, I would rather that they get deep into the subject matter and use that platform that they have. Um, that doesn't happen often, but that doesn't mean we can't encourage it. I have no problem with celebrities speaking out on these issues. Uh, I hope they'll do it really effectively. Some historically do and some historically don't. I think what Jay-Z was saying, if you think about it, it, it was a very similar kind of aspirational comment to what, you know, when MLK says an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, well, that was an abstract philosophical notion, too. And we know that, in fact, the injustices that were being done to black folks when King said that was not really hurting everybody equally. Yeah. Just like when Jay says, you know, if I'm oppressed, everybody's oppressed. That's not actually true, but in a philosophical, cosmic sort of sense, which I think is how both King meant it and Jay-Z meant it. I'm not saying Jay-Z equals MLK. By no, I don't think you are. I think the argument, the argument is similar, right? And so... I'm willing to say that's a really nice aspirational comment, but just like MLK's comment, it's it's a it's it's a larger metaphorical kind of thing. It's not practically the case, and we we do need to, whenever possible, speak more directly to what the reality is. But but I'm I'm encouraged by the the idea that increasingly, whether it's LeBron, who who I agree, I mean I think the argument can clearly be made that he dropped the ball in the case of Tamir Rice. Since that time, not only him, but other athletes and other, other uh, celebrities have, I think, increasingly waded into these waters. Now, it's not going to be easy, it's going to be messy, and they're going to make mistakes, just like we're all going to make mistakes. And, and, and I only can hope that as they make those mistakes, those of us who do this work can reach out to them, can, can, can help sort of improve the messaging right that people with that platform are trying to use. Because you see, you see celebrities whose intentions, I think, are often very good, who don't know exactly how to say stuff. And that's not just with black athletes. I mean, like last month, um, Lady Gaga said something on Twitter that, that, that got her attacked because it was real naive. She said something about, you know, like basically asking black folks and brown folks, how can we who love you help, right? Which is like a really naive kind of thing that if, you, if, you, if you're deep in this stuff, you know you don't just go around asking people, how can I help? And you don't go around acting like you're the non-racist and all the other white people are the racist. But I'm going to cut her slack too because I realize she has not... I can't get mad at you for not knowing stuff that you almost have no way you could have known based on what you were exposed to. My job is to expose you to it. My job is to make sure, like, okay, you said that, that was a little bit naive, but hey, here's another way to say it. And then now, once I bring that to you, if you still keep going back to that easy, 
sort of watered down thing, then then that's a different issue. But I feel like a lot of times celebrity, I, I don't like holding people accountable for things that there's almost no way they could have known, or the fact that they're just not there yet. No, I I, 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 I totally agree with you because like I mean, in one instance, like when I get when I met Dre, I made sure I gave him my copy of the new Jim Crow from Michelle. Uh, Xander and also accountable from Tavis Smiley, you know, yeah. and, then, and then he'll be up to him to read it or to listen to the audio, which I gave him an accountable. But I more so still, I push back on LeBron. I mean, I, I look at the conundrum of having somebody who sells expensive product at overpriced price points, making a message about black oppression, whether they're black or white. And so fundamentally what, what ends up happening to me is, is this is more than just a muddling of a message. It's also a confusion of a message by capital itself in the sense that capital doesn't want to deal with black oppression. They like the way that things have been going. And and I, I look over at, at, at Jay-Z and I see not much different. You know, it's funny because because Puff Daddy called for the, the, the protests of all the players the day before. And what, what ended up happening, I don't know if you saw that video. He did it, I think, on a selfie stick or something. And then, yeah. and then the next day... Yeah, the, the next, walking around a million dollar house. I mean, just like you have Jay Z here talking about running into a house. Guy who has a man who just bought a mansion in Bel Air talking about people running into their house and into Trump's house or some. And so, like, my problem with what we're seeing right now is because of the wealth inequality, black celebrity is being put into a position that white celebrity never is. You know, black celebrity when you go go, go i challenge everybody to go look at black voices um on huffington post as i as we speak it'll be black celebrity i challenge everybody to look back at the hillary clinton campaign you know it's it's interviews with mary j blige it's the breakfast club it's jay-z being brought out on stage so in a in a sense black celebrity is being used to mute the very very good work being done by black activists and i don't think we've been honest about that and I guess that that that's the conundrum is like, is it is it you know? And it, this isn't something we'll answer in this one Skype video, but it, it isn't is it, it isn't to me just a matter of them being confused and needing to be made aware. It's them actually receiving great benefits from Nike existing, from the NFL existing, and who wants that to end? You know, so I'll go on two knees if I'm Ray Lewis. I'll come out as, as LeBron and talk about unity and all this stuff. That doesn't make a lot of sense when Tamir Rice was shot down. But what I won't do is what Cap did. I stand with Cap myself. And what I won't do is risk it all. Walk away from the game and say what I need to say. I won't do what Muhammad Ali did, which is basically go to jail and lose my belts. And I, I think that that's the, the challenge is like who's with it and who's not. And I think that that's where we need to dig. I'm not putting you in any position, but I'm just giving you my kind of statement on it. Um, no, go ahead. Fair. I think, that's a, I think that's fair and, and a logical argument that is, is I don't I, I would not I would not ask more of black athletes in that regard or black celebrities than I would white athletes or celebrities I do think that the, I wouldn't want to invert the responsibility for blowing up one's career and put it all on those who, who have the, the most to lose if that happens I don't think they have less responsibility either it's sort of like what um, it's what it's what Dyson said about um about Obama in 09, I think he said, you know, like, I, I don't want to ask, I'm not going to ask more of him than I would Bill Clinton or more of him than I would George W. Bush. Why should a black president be, why should white presidents be any less responsive to the needs of racial equity? Now, in practicality, we know the answer to that. But, but what Dyson was trying to say was he's not going to suggest that because this man is a man of color, he therefore should be held to a higher standard. But we also can't hold him to a lower standard, which I think sometimes we did. Mm -hmm. right? And I think the same can be true in the in the world of celebrity. So I just want to make sure that's why I thought it was very important that Greg Popovich came out and did what he did and said what he said on ESPN the other day as a white head basketball coach in the NBA coming out and making a statement about whiteness and, and, and the phoniness of whiteness and the reality of white privilege that we need that from white folks. We, we need white athletes to do that. Uh, as well as expecting black athletes and, 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 and athletes of color to take a stand or to take a knee or whatever the case might be. Um, I, we all got to do more, but I just wouldn't want to put that burden uniquely on folks who are the, the most marginalized within the system because they didn't create the system. I don't, I, I, I'm not asking them to play by different rules than the larger system plays by. We're trying to change the system for everybody, you know, theoretically. No, I totally, I totally understand where you're coming from and just my pushback 
is yeah. when you sell rap with nothing more than the imagery of young black like people that went to prison and sold crack. I'm gonna ask a lot of you. When you're the president and you were voted in because black people yeah. that had never voted before came out and voted for you because you look like somebody that came from American slavery. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm think that you ask, you owe that group that gave you that head start and really the leg into the White House, not the whole foot in, but the leg into the White House a lot right. more. So, and I say the same thing for LeBron. It's like Cleveland held you up and it's like, if you're going to say the land and use that a whole like language to kind of inroads into your Nike product, when Tamir is shot down, you got to be there. And that's just the yeah. pushback I have. So, um, yeah. you know, it, you know, we just a couple more sections here. I know it's been a little long, but it's a great discussion. I appreciate you coming on to tone talks again. You'll have to come on my radio show in a couple of uh, weeks on dash yeah. radio as well. Um, let's look at this NCAA basketball FBI thing. For me, what I'm seeing is white privilege on full display. You have uh, all these assistant coaches lived a straight up life, avoided prison, stayed away from drugs, and just got plugged into a system and played their part. A system where black players were not paid above board, but coaches made millions. If you look state to state, many of the highest paid public employees are college football or basketball coaches. NCAA teams, um, NCAA schools built stadiums on ticket money, on TV contracts, on apparel deals. Right. All predicated on the players, but players were not paid. And that scholarship is not payment. So what we have is a system where the cost to make the player was passed to black families. Right. And so now the way that it all worked is a grease system where that black family was paid in the backside by the apparel agency. And then that grease money allowed for players to be created in the future. The people who took that grease money are now being thrown under the bus as if they created the system. And some facing like Tony Bland, 80 years, some facing like the gentleman over at Oliver Auburn, 80 years. And you then have Patino on the other side, who's who claims to not know. No one, no, no one knows now. Every everybody can take credit for the championship, right? When the championship comes, it's just Patino did it. It's an accolade for Patino. Right. But the championship is built on all of this grease jobs that are done. And so then when he goes wrong, what they say is like, oh, he lost his job, but maybe he'll land on TV. If that ain't white privilege, I've never seen it. And I want you just to speak on what you think about the NCAA FBI investigation. Really important point. I think, I think what this all points to systemically is, is the absurdity of having a system whereby, and this goes back to that reverse Robin Hood point that I made uh, a, a little while ago about black wealth, the lack thereof, ultimately subsidizing white wealth. I mean, this is an example in collegiate athletics where a disproportionate number of athletes, particularly in, 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 the, in the big revenue sports of, of basketball and football, are African-American, making millions and millions of dollars for their mostly white institutions. Um, in the case of most of those top D1 schools that are the most competitive year after year, not all of them, but the overwhelming number of them, a disproportionate number of those black athletes will not graduate. They will play a year, they may play two years, then they may play briefly in the in the NBA or they may end up going to Europe to play or they may get injured and not play at all. So like you said, the scholarship is not clearly not payment because you're not even finishing the, finishing the degree. So if I'm not finishing the degree, what did I get out of that? Maybe I'll play a couple years in the NBA. I think the average time that the, the, the average player plays might be three or four years. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 right, and, and by the time you're done, whether you graduated or didn't, let's say you go play NBA ball for three, four years. You might get lucky and play longer if you're if you're a superstar, but the vast majority will not play at all, or they'll play a couple of years, and then they're 25, and they got a degree that may or may not be worth anything, um, unless they can parlay that into being a commentator, you know, on a on a radio show or a television show. They're not going to have a career that's going to be sports related in most cases. They're not getting hired in the front offices of these teams after they play for them. So. So clearly, if you have a system where all the revenue is being produced, really, and the benefits are going to white folks, whether it's the Patinos or the 
most of the head coaches or whether it's athletic departments or whether it's the stadium and the construction companies that build the stadium that are white owned companies 99 times out of 100 whatever it is it's black folks doing the work white people reaping the benefits that is a that is a inherently colonial or even slave type relationship because i'm literally doing labor for free you know because i mean people that were enslaved got housing but that we didn't call that income right that you know and so so you got an athlete that's getting a, a dorm room that's housing but that's not income unless we change that you're going to see more of the kind of quote unquote corruption that's happening now now here, here's the only thing i think that the problem is we have to change that system because i, I don't necessarily think it's right that a handful of big, successful programs are able to do what Louisville did while other programs cannot. The reason Louisville could do that and pay that kind of money was because that was a prize commodity. Getting that gig at Louisville to be on that team was a big thing, whereas getting the, getting the same kind of ride at a school that wasn't at that level wouldn't have been as big a thing. So if we're going to have a, have a system of rules, I think it's important that everybody plays by them. But because we know they're not going to, we have to change that system because that is going to encourage the very same kind of thing that we're seeing and then ultimately, rather than fix the system, we'll throw a couple folk in jail potentially for having been behind it. We'll ignore the coaches who, of course, know that this stuff is going on and nothing will change. So we have to make sure that if, if I'm bringing money to you, there's a moral obligation that I be compensated commensurate with the value that I'm producing for you. Yeah. And, and you can put that in a trust if you want to put it in a trust because you want to say 18-year-olds don't know how to manage money. I know that's true. 18-year-olds of whatever race don't, don't know how to manage Pause money. Pause for a second, though. We If we're going to say that, we should be saying it in tennis. We should be saying it in baseball. We should be, but we don't say that because that's not American. That's not capitalism. And so, like, what's interesting about this whole about this whole setup is fundamentally Louisville. I'm talking about Louisville, the the the, the school that got this. They don't promise you to go to the NBA like Kentucky, like the Wildcats. And so, what what most of their 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 like roster is stock full of is people that play four years and then maybe go to the NBA. What's interesting about the whole thing is like you're making real money for this school with a lottery chance. And I, I literally mean to possibly make money for yourself when you're on television, actual television. And what's what the other part that we forget, because these are big six, three African American males with a lot of testosterone. Some of them look grown that they're children, teenagers, 18 and 19. And so these 18 and 19 year olds then have to take a secondary contract with an agent or somebody to even get a piece of the money that they already made for the school. And I think that, you know, when we come down to it, so much of this has roots in going back to peonage, going back to slavery, going back to the bad contracts that so many were forced into. And we as a nation really don't want to confront how much this has to do with white privilege. I certainly can't prove this, but I think that if collegiate sports were not as demographically black dominated in those two major revenue sports, if it was overwhelmingly white, um, I think we would have a lot more people supporting the paying mm. players, right? I, I think there's part of part of part of Ameri white, white, white America's racial hang up that I think is involved with the NFL protest, frankly, is that white folks really get angry about black folks making too much money, quote unquote, right? Whether that is as a pro football player, pro basketball player, let alone as a college one, whereas we wouldn't have the same effect, you know, and actually the NFL protest is a good example. So if, you know, if you're Donald Trump, you can be a rich white man and your whole message can be America sort of sucks. That's why we need to make it great again because it's a quote unquote third world country. That's what he said during the campaign. We don't do anything right. We're, everybody beats us. We're, we're no good. We need to be made great again. Now that is a complaint. That is a criticism of America, a very serious one being issued by a rich white dude. And nobody says to him, well, you ungrateful, you know what? Like, what are you talking about? What? Where could you make this much money? Where could you have inherited a real estate portfolio worth $230 million from your dad uh, when you were a young man in the late 70s, early 80s, and he handed it off to you when he retired? No one says that. Black person, in Colin Kaepernick's case, had an $11 million contract, last contract he had, 11 mil. That pales in comparison to what Donald Trump has, uh, even, even what we know he has, let alone what he says he has. But all of a sudden, Kaepernick is ungrateful. All of a sudden, millionaires are ungrateful if they're black. Billionaires who are white are not. So, no, so clearly, we have a problem with black folks making money, particularly more than us. 
And I think if collegiate sports weren't so black, that white folks would be like, yeah, you know, we need to let those white guys make a little money. But the blackness actually makes us feel we're already angry that they're in those colleges in some cases. We're already angry because we already think black folks are taking our kids' college slots, quote, unquote. That's what we're being told, whether it's for sports or whether it's because of affirmative action programs or whatever it is. So we're already feeling threatened by what we consider to be entitled, quote, unquote, black folks, which is great irony because only people really entitled are the white folks in that equation. But I think that this whole thing, I, you're absolutely right, it speaks to white privilege, it speaks to the normalization of whiteness, and until that system of, of how we do collegiate sports has changed, rather than what it is right now, which is basically white folks saying, we don't have to pay you athletes, you ought to be glad that you're getting an education. We're giving you an education, right? Even though we're not really insistent that you finish, we're not insistent that you study, we're not insistent that you actually go to class, we're not insistent that you actually learn anything, and we don't care if you leave in two years as long as you bring us a championship, or in one year at Kentucky, uh, one and done, you know, and as long as you bring us a championship, we don't care. We'll Go a step further and say, as long as you bring us a, a, a shoe contract and, and a TV and a TV deal, right, <laughs> we really, you know, if, if they'll give it to us without the championship, we'll take that. And right. so, and so, you know, transitioning out of sports into the last section, I'm going to use two data points to kind of like bring us into Obama and a recent statement that you made about Kamala standing up to Jeff Sessions. What I, you know, recently, so, some of my, I have to disclose, there's some of they're my editors from inequality.org, Chuck Collins, Josh Hoxie, uh, and also Diedrich um, and a few other, I mean, just wonderful work that they did. What they showed is by 2053, the middle black family will be worth $0.00 on this track that we're on, it won't be until 20, around 75, that the middle Latino family will be worth $0 in and of itself. That brings us to a whole question about the people of color, like pedagogy, and whether people of color has begun to diminish the discussion about reparations and blackness, which we'll also deal with in this last section. But, it, but also we saw the new Federal Reserve data come out this week separate and apart and Matt Brunig did a wonderful set of, of, of charts and data, and I'm actually going to have a piece coming out early next week with Matt. But one of the things that he showed is that black people outside of the two, top 2% 2 of black America did, did work bad under Obama. And, and he showed this using data. And I guess I bring to you the question of not so much an evaluation of Obama, because, you know, he's, he's coming when we know, we know what happened. But how then do you connect your larger position of, 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 of looking at, you know, dismantling racism, moving the racial wealth gap closer, if Kamala Harris seems like a variation of Obama? Right. Well, my exuberance for Senator Harris in that particular social media post was probably a bit more exuberant than it needed to be. Let's put it that way. I know there are real issues with her. Um, just like there are real issues with any mainstream member of the Democratic Party, uh, even the more liberal, quote-unquote, members of that party. She has a mixed bag history in, in the state as a law enforcement official herself. So I realize that there are things about her, just like just like Senator Obama when he was senator, um, that I disagree with. Uh, my comment was more about saying that in, in the pantheon of Democratic candidates, who I always expect, frankly, to be inadequate to the task in and of themselves of moving the needle very far, um, she certainly stands quite a bit above most of the others that I can think of at this moment within that party who are likely to be a candidate at some point in the future. And so ultimately, when I say that I might support her in that sense, it's not that I, I'm not going to phone bank for her, I'm not going to go out and knock doors for her unless I see her take some really transformational stances. But I do think that in this particular political system that we have, I also understand what the game is, and I understand that we have to sometimes realize that we have to do the work. We have to make, whether it's Kamala Harris or whether it's Barack Obama or whether it's Bill Clinton or whether it's whoever it is, whether it's Bernie Sanders, whether it's whoever, we ultimately have to make them do the work. And I, and I expect, the thing about Obama, the reason I wasn't particularly disappointed by President Obama was I didn't, I didn't really expect all that much from President Obama. Do I think President Obama did a better job than any of those he was opposing would have done? Absolutely. Do I think that's adequate? No. Don't think that's sufficient. But I expect the, the head of the empire to act like the head of the empire. The empire itself has to change. The empire itself has to be, quote unquote, brought down, if you will. And that's our job. If we're not doing that job, those of us in the, in the larger society, then nobody is going to deliver 
the kind of change that we're talking about, whether it's whether it's Barack Obama, Kamala Harris, whoever it is, nobody is going to be able to move the needle significantly if we're not demanding it as a condition of our support or as a condition of of just everyday life. Like we have to be in the streets demanding certain things. We have to be boycotting, protesting, doing whatever it is that we need to do, or else they will go with whoever their donors are, whoever their funders are. And the idea that we can just sort of withhold a vote from them and things will change on their own, I'm not sure that that's sufficient. And so we can't do politics one day out of every four years or one day out of every two for a congressional race. Um, I think the thing about that that wealth data that was so interesting that you mentioned, and, and this goes to what we have to also think about the way media frames these issues. So what you just said about uh, black wealth really only being increased in that top 2%, is a really important point because if you looked at the way the Washington Post framed this same story, the same Federal Reserve study that the Washington Post, the way they talked about it two days ago, was their headline was minorities and non-college educated, the only ones who saw wealth gain or had, had the biggest wealth gains. And I saw that headline, I was like, wait a minute, what? Minorities and non-college folk had the biggest wealth gains in the last few years? I have to check that out. So I looked at it and I'm like, I don't really understand where this argument's coming from. Then I saw what you sent me, which I hadn't seen yet, because I knew that that just didn't make any sense, because a, a previous study that you referenced before talked about how things were going backwards, not forwards. And then I realized when I saw what you sent that the gains by that top 2% were substantial enough, right, that it closed the gap or, or it made it made the overall black numbers, let's say, go up. But that's that's hiding and obscuring this other fact, right, that the 98% of the black community actually had net declines or nothing, either no gain or a net decline in wealth. So the way the media framed the issue also does us a lot, of, a lot of harm. It's not just a politician the way a politician frames it. It's the way that our talking heads frame it. It's the way that our media frames it. So we have to push back on all of that because otherwise I think we end up missing the story, which is that that the last eight years did not improve the condition of the vast majority of black folks although there was a narrow group that did very well. The same is sort of true during the 90s. I mean, in the 90s, you had a bit more broad-based gains for black folk, but it was still concentrated. I don't, it wasn't probably in the top 2%, but I guarantee it was in the top 20, you know, yeah. top 15, top top 10, right? So, but we always talk about the 90s as this period, of, this period. of growth for everyone, and that's not really what happened. Well, man, uh, yeah, that, that last word was powerful. I appreciate you coming on the Tone Talk. The discussion, debate, dialogue that we had. I think people will enjoy that. Um, definitely look forward to having you on my talk show, Dash Radio, 10, uh, start October 6th, 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. I'll probably try to have you on sometime early November. Um, thank you so much. Um,